All right, so let's talk about making inferences um, in uh, for the for the general linear model. Uh, we'll make inferences for for parameters, and then we'll also make inferences. I don't have it listed here as a title for this, but um, we'll also be making uh, confidence intervals for the mean response, and also make um, uh, so working hoteling. Uh, interval estimates, Bonferroni estimates, uh, interval estimates, and, and and prediction intervals and so forth. So, um, uh, all right, so provided the, the model assumptions are met, that is the, the models for doing the general linear model, um, then it turns out the expected value of our of our estimators for the betas are, are, are the betas themselves. So they are um, unbiased estimators for the betas. Then the covariance matrix of of the B's can be written like this. Okay, here's our our actual notation for it. It's it's important to remember that these B's, our estimates, are actually random variables themselves, right? Okay, so so the the covariance or variance covariance matrix um, is given by this, right? It's just a symmetric matrix where you have the variances of the B values down along the main diagonal and the covariances in the lower and upper tri triangles. This covariance matrix is actually now is it's actually conditional conditional on the actual x values, which remember for most of this course we're actually thinking that like you can you can set the x values okay that the x values are not necessarily random. So if you fix the x values, then these 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 b's are are estimates are for the for the betas are actually random variables. Um, turns out. You can write this. This is a good exercise for you to try. Um, you can write the this variance covariance matrix as x trans. This x here is our data matrix with the column of ones, and then with our our x values transpose times itself, inverse of all of that, and then times this right here. This is our our uh, the, the the common error variance. Okay, which we estimate this. Uh, because of course you know you don't ever actually know the sigma squared here. We estimate this with MSE, the mean squared error, times x transpose x inverse. Okay. Um, so then, if the the if the assumptions for the general linear model are met, then it turns out a good test statistic for making the inferences uh, making inferences on the betas is just guess what it's what you it's your best point estimator for a beta right minus what it is under the null hypothesis and then divide by the 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 standard error the standard deviation of that estimator okay or our standard uh, deviation estimate which you would get from this vector here right this is uh, or well this is a this is a matrix I guess so um, this is a, a matrix of estimates these are variances along the main diagonal um, uh, sample variances along the main diagonal, and so what you would do is is use those values down here in the in the denominator. Um, again, this is our old familiar form for making um, test statistics, right? You take your best guess for for the test statistic, and then you standardize it, subtract off the mean of it under the null hypothesis, and then divide by the standard deviation of that estimator. Um, in this case, uh, this thing turns out to be under our assuming the assumptions for doing the linear model or or holding. It's a has a is a has a t random variable just or it behaves like a t random variable with n minus p degrees of freedom. Again, n is the number of data points, and p is the number of parameters in your model. So this tells us right off exactly how we can make um, confidence intervals for the betas. Okay, if I were if if I'm not making simultaneous uh, inferences, then um, if I'm just doing them one at a time, and I you know, I want to do it one minus alpha uh, confidence level, then I just have to go and find the appropriate t number. Okay, with n minus p degrees of freedom. Um, I've got alpha over two in the upper tail region, right? Um, and so uh, I'll take my best guess, plus or minus that t number times the standard deviation, right? That you re that you get from this matrix. 
Um, you can also make uh, confidence intervals for parameters using the Bonferroni method if you want to make simultaneous and for uh, intervals. Um, the only adjustment is just as before you just uh, you just have to adjust this um, uh, alpha level down here the, the the error rate remember the the family if you have the if you're given the family error rate then you just uh, divide that by the number of intervals you you, you make um, to get the the individual error rate okay um, so this test statistic behavior, uh, given that we know how this guy behaves, this also suggests a procedure for making hypothesis tests for the betas. Okay, so for example, under the null hypothesis, you might uh, uh, you might have that the that that one of these betas is equal to some number. It could be zero. It could be ten. It could be negative fifty. Whatever it is, maybe the alternative hypothesis is that it's uh, not equal to that number. Similarly, you could do left-tailed or right-tailed tests. Okay, and if you want to do a left-tailed test, then you, you just have to look in the left tail region under a t-curve. Or if you're doing a right-tailed test, you just look in the the right tail. Okay, so um, and again, so here's a, your test statistic. It's it's the, your best guess for the b um, minus the value under the null hypothesis and divide by the standard deviation. Okay, and then so in the in the two-tailed test case, you take the absolute value of this guy, right? The 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 p-value is going to be the chance that you see something this strange or stranger off in either direction underneath a t-curve. Okay, um, so actually, I haven't really said so in here, but if alpha is your significance level, then yeah, this is how you'd run a, a two-tailed test. Um, but again, you know, in modern times, oftentimes what, what what people will do is not even set an alpha level. You just get the p-value, and the p-value is going to be the 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 tail area probability. Um, you, you find your test statistic value if you're doing the two-tailed test scenario. Then you you find um, the the tail area that corresponds to to whatever your test statistic is, and then double it. Okay, and that'll that'll give you your your p-value. Remember the p-value is the chance that you'd see something as strange or stranger than what you saw if in fact the null hypothesis is really true. Okay, we can also construct confidence intervals for mean responses. Let um, let h be, uh, maybe h stands for here, right here. Okay, so uh, let's say you're looking at um, h, uh, x h1, x h2, and so, and so forth. These are you can think of this whole collection of x's as one observation. Okay, this is an, an observation of one variable. This is observ an observation of an of another variable. This is uh, and the, so you have a you know sev observations on several variables. You think of these as as one data point. Okay, um, and so uh, this is sort of one data point. Um, this is uh, you might think of this as this is a row that's been plucked out of our data matrix. Okay, so an unbiased estimator for the for the mean response is x transpose h times beta. Right? If you turn this thing over and, and make it a row vector, and then if I multiply this guy by by our betas, there you get one times beta naught plus x h1 times beta 1 plus x h2 times beta 2 and so forth. Of course you don't actually know the betas it just turns out that an, an unbiased estimator for the actual um, mean response is given by your, uh, your your hat value at that at that location so x uh, this h here denotes a you know sort of a, a particular location if it, th this y hat value is the is the is the prediction value or the the uh, ba fr from your model that's that's based on this point if you were to plug this point into your model this is the 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 hat value that gets returned it's this is the 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 response variable val value that sits on the regression surface so this uh, and this is how you get it exactly right you you get your b's your b's are your beta estimates that you get from doing that x transpose x quantity inverse times x transpose um, y stuff um, that's your b stuff multiply it by this guy you get your 
predicted response right there. Um, the variance of this estimator then just turns out to be xh transpose times sigma squared. Uh, the, this is your um, this is your covariance matrix for the for the b's for your uh, 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 coefficient estimates, and then times x h again. So um, and so we but of course we don't we don't know these exactly so we estimate this matrix with our our s squared matrix and so um, we, we plop that in right there so this tells us right away how to make confidence intervals for the for the actual mean response we take uh, our best guess if for it if we're at location uh, x h okay h is for here right here um, you take your best guess for the response at that location, which is predicted by the model. It's your model fit right there at that at that point, plus or minus some t number times the standard deviation. It's the same form, same stuff that you learned in your basic. Uh, it's the same form as com of confidence intervals that uh, as they had when you had your basic statistics class. So we can obtain a one minus alpha confidence region turns out for for a regression surface um, that is if you think of a regression surface as a, as a plane you can actually get um, surrounding surfaces surfaces that, that sort of surround that that regression surface by using that working hoteling procedure um, extended to the multivariate case um, turns out the, the boundary points that form these surfaces are functions of whatever your you know x h values are and these points are given by uh, by this stuff okay um, here's your w w is for working hoteling it turns out it's it's p your the number of parameters times this f number um, this is uh, this now in your book when they put this area up here and it's not in the subscript this is the area to the left underneath a uh, an F curve. It's got P numerator degrees of freedom and N minus P denominator degrees of freedom. Um, multiply that F number by the number of parameters and then take the square root of the whole thing and that gets your W. So it's it's the same as this uh, T interval except the, the that T number is replaced by this W statistic. Okay, so um, we can also make uh, J simultaneous confidence intervals for for mean responses by making that the the Bonferroni adjustment as usual, and um, also you can make prediction intervals for new responses. Um, that's often of interest. You want to you know where are we pretty sure that we're going to see our next predictions if we observe x values at a certain place. Okay, um, that's uh, and given by these formulas here. Okay. And uh, if you want to do multiple prediction intervals, um, we use uh, these limit points here. So, uh, so next, what we'll do is take another look at an example. Let's look back at this commercial properties example, and we'll stick to modeling uh, rental rate with age, expenses and taxes, and square footage. We'll leave out that other variable that we already decided that that vacancy rates variable is probably not significant. So we'll leave it out of the model and make uh, simultaneous Bonferroni 95% uh, confidence intervals for the three slope parameters okay I've got the code down here um, uh, here's my number one stuff and then I've got stuff to do number two okay so we'll just uh, we'll just work through this stuff okay so the first thing I'm gonna do is well pull up R here um, I'm gonna get my my data set and um, and attach it. I've already got it pulled up here. Again, it's that data set uh, that we were using from before, uh, trying to predict uh, um, rental rates versus various other variables. I'm not going to use this VR variable. Okay, um, I'm going to do it the long way, and then I'll do it the short way. Okay, um, I'm going to get a vector of ones. Okay, and then for my data matrix, I'm going to uh, C bind that vector of ones with these uh, these three right so I'm gonna uh, leave out the the VR variable and and I'm also gonna leave out the RR variable because this is the one I'm trying to predict right 
and so um, also a need for um, my uh, uh, y variable. I'm going to let um, y be that uh, the, this rental rates variable, and um, it needs to be as a matrix, okay, so that I can do matrix multiplication, and my my data matrix, my x matrix, also needs to be as a matrix, so that I can do matrix multiplication. Then I can solve for those uh, regression coefficients if I do that x transpose x uh, quantity inverse times x transpose times y and you can see in fact right I think we did this before um, and I can get my hat matrix um, as I did before and uh, store my residuals or my residuals is uh, will, will be my vector of residuals will be the the my y's minus uh, the hat matrix times the y's because it's y minus y hat, right? And um, SSE is uh, it's just the dot product of the residuals vector with itself, right? Um, so I can take the transpose of the residuals. That's a row vector of residuals uh, multiplied in the matrix multiplication way times the vector of residuals is a column vector. And um, and so, uh, by the way, so that, that should return a scalar Okay. Um, uh, now R is taking this to be a matrix. It's a one by one matrix. So you have to keep that in mind if you want to do some multiplication with it, or, or some other kind of operations. Um, it's not just a number. Um, we'll see in a second. In fact, if I if I want to do MSE, uh, mean square error, then then um, what I could do. I mean, mean MSE is uh, it's technically now it looks like a matrix but um, probably really what I want to do is treat it like a scalar so I could just assign MSE to be actually um, the the number that's in row one column one of that matrix and then there okay now now if I do class of MSE you'll see that it's it's numeric it's no longer a matrix okay um, I can get the covariance matrix of the parameter estimates um, if I uh, just follow the formula that's in the notes there, it's uh, uh, th this is my uh, um, my estimate of the covariance matrix for for B for my for my B's. It's remember we're using MSE times the inverse of x transpose x. Okay, and um, so th then I can get individual confidence uh, level uh, Bonferroni adjustment. That that's going to be um, I'll call it CL. Okay, it's uh, I'm making I'm going to make three of these things right. I think that's what the 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 deal said. It said make simultaneous Bonferroni confidence intervals for th for the three slope parameters. Okay, so uh, I've got four parameters in my model. Uh, three of them are slopes, and one is the the intercept parameter. So I'm just not I'm not going to make a confidence interval for the intercept parameter for whatever reason. Ninety five percent is my family confidence level, so I'm going to take uh, the the family error rate, which is five percent, divided by three because I'm making three intervals, and then subtract that from one, and you see, whoops, I can't read my own typing. That's not a C one. That's a CL for confidence level. Okay, it's ninety eight point three repeating percent, and then. Um, I'm going to um, make a new variable called UTA for upper tail area, okay, and um, and and th that is, uh, I want to find that uh, upper tail area under a T-curve that I'm looking for. It's really going to be this amount plus half the difference between that and one, okay. Um, and so uh, then if I want to make a confidence interval for the age coefficient, I'm just going to plop in that, uh, that code there. Um, look, I'm just following the formula, right? I'm going to take my best guess minus this T number, okay, and then times SB of age. SB of age I've set to be equal to the square root of the, of the element in that covariance matrix uh, cov mat b the se the the second uh, the the second diagonal element right all those those uh, variances there are along the the long, along the diagonal of that matrix i want to get the square root of that and and store it in there okay so these are my uh, 
my uh, lower and upper confidence limits for the, the age coefficient. Okay. Uh, similarly, I can make a confidence interval for the um, coefficient for the expenses and taxes. And I do like so. Okay. It's the same kind of deal, right? I'm just uh, I gotta remember to to pluck off the the square root of the of the correct element of my covariance um, matrix, and stick it here. Get the right t number, and use my best guess for um, for for the b's, which is for for betas, which is my 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 b's, right? And then. Um, Finally, let's see the last one, the confidence interval for the square footage uh, coefficient. I can do like like so, okay. And um, by the way, th these uh, th these numbers are pretty small, right? So that so it looks like our 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 coefficient for our square footage estimate. Um, I mean, this th this is our best guess for it, right? So, and that's pretty small. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's not important, okay? Because remember, these this number will have units associated with it, okay? So, just because it's uh, it looks like a small number doesn't mean it really is a small number. Um, okay, let's compare these three confidence intervals with um, the uh, uh, quick and easy way, okay? Um, Oops, well that's not it. Um, let's, uh, let's do the linear model for rental rates versus age, expenses and taxes, and square footage. And then um, let's take a look if I do summary out. Um, okay, and I, I see here are my best guess estimates. Um, here's the, the way you can do that. Once you run the, the linear model command and uh, store all that information in a variable like out, I can do conf int and then put the, the name that, that you're storing all the information in and then put in your um, level level equals C1. Put in your individual confidence level rate okay and of course that's uh, getting an error and that's because again I can't read my own typing that's not a one that's a uh, that's an L confidence level there we go okay and so you should see that, that these intervals um, actually match up now um, they've given us the an interval for the intercept too okay uh, be careful here you can't use this one right um, we have adjusted our confidence level to be the individual confidence level when we're making three of them simultaneously. Okay, so so we can't use this this intercept uh, one along with these other ones. Um, if I wanted to do that, I need I'd need to take 95 percent. Um, uh, what it would be one a quarter. I guess it'd be uh, uh, I don't know. You'd have to re redo that confidence level calculation. What um, Let's compare these. Make sure that they're right. For the SQF, it's uh, 4.98 times 10 to the negative sixth or so. Uh, yeah, 4.98 times 10 to the negative sixth. This is our upper endpoint, 1.13 something times 10 to the negative fifth. Yep, there it is for um, for age. It's like negative 1.953 something times 10 to the negative first. Um, yep, there it is. Okay, so you see the, the methods work the same. Um, this method right here is way better way better because it's so fast All right so part two says um, uh, test for significance that the intercept terms uh, actually differ significantly from from zero okay so for that I'm just going to um, let's let's compute our test statistic okay I'm just going to use that formula I'm, I'm picking up my my uh, what is my best guess for the intercept term? It's 1.237 times 10 to the first. So that's 12.37 is my best guess for it. We want to know that if it's uh, significantly different from zero, so I'll divide then by the the square root of the first element in that variance covariance matrix. Okay, so that's my test statistic. And then my p-value is going to be twice that tail area. Okay, so it'll be two times and this is uh, the this is the the probability under a t distribution. Um, uh, I know that this this test statistic is is positive. I'm going to go 
So I'm going to turn it negative, and I want the tail area between negative infinity and all the way up to negative this test statistic, which is a negative number. Um, and then go, uh, th here's my degrees of freedom. There's my p-value. It's, uh, what is it, p-value? It's pretty darn small, okay? Um, let's compare it with uh, the the quick way, okay? If I, if I do um, uh, summary out, let's see. Note that the p-value listed for this test is, uh, is right here. It says it's less than 2 times 10 to the negative 16th. It doesn't tell you exactly what it is. It just says, hey, it's really, really small. It's so small that we're quitting. R sort of gave up there. It's um, under some preset tolerance or threshold here. So, so there you go. Now, for number three here, it says make simultaneous Bonferroni confidence, 95% uh, confidence intervals for mean response when the predictors are set to these two values. So, um, for some reason, maybe these two uh, values are, 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 are of interest to you. Um, this five is for the age, this five is for expenses and taxes, and this is um, uh, square footage. And maybe you're also interested in somehow making a confidence interval for mean response when age is 10 and expenses and taxes are 10 and square footage is 100. So, um, you know what? Uh, you can follow the formula and all that stuff. Hey, let's just use the predict function because it's getting late and that's way easy. So, um, uh, I tell you what, I need to get those two points into R, so I'll call them point one and point two. Okay, I'll do them like that. And I'll um, row bind them, uh, point one and point two, like so. And, um, I'll say uh, points, uh, that's, uh, I'm going to say, uh, uh, yeah, let's, let's, I should have done it like this, points, there, store that stuff in points, so now points is a, is a matrix, actually, I don't know what, what is points, uh, it's a matrix, okay, points is a matrix, um, but it turns out when, when you do this, um, uh, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to want to use that predict function that we used before, um, and and this points business will will be our our matrix or collection of new points that we want to predict with. And if you re, if you recall, that predict function is pretty peculiar. It really has to have this stuff in a data frame. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, reclassify it. Um, say as, no, sorry, and just say data frame, that's how you do it, points, okay, there you go, because um, it must be a data frame, um, must be a data frame, all right, um, now, what, what's the class of that guy, it's a, it's a data frame, okay, good, okay, so now, um, let's uh, do out, um, linear model of uh, RR versus age uh, plus ET phone home plus SQF okay uh, there we go and um, yeah um, so uh, th there's one other thing here um, turns out and this was a mistake I've made in the past and just figured out actually turns out that this uh, this points data frame um, let's check it out real quick um, it turns out these the, the names across here have to match exactly the names of the variables in your model okay so um, if they don't when you go and you use this predict function it, you're gonna see it makes a whole bunch of intervals it's gonna make like one interval uh, for each one of your predicted values is gonna essentially ignore the new data points that you're putting in here so I'm gonna say names of points whoops names of points um, is uh, age, right, ET, and uh, SQF. All right, now I can do, um, I can write that predict 
function. And um, predict, I'm going to use my output, right, out from the linear model. New equals, this is where you specify the, the, the that points data frame. Um, again, it's it's got to be a data frame and it has to have the same variable names across the top as, as it does in the, in the in your model. And you can uh, tell it if you want to make confidence intervals or prediction intervals. Here we want to make confidence intervals and you set uh, the level here is 0.975 because our family error rate is 5% so our individual error rate is going to be 2.5%. Uh, Okay, and so that's just uh, hashtag uh, Bonferroni, just indicating that uh, we're doing the Bonferroni adjustment. Okay, and um, and so there you go. Um, here is uh, here's the fit for point one, and then here are my uh, lower and upper um, interval endpoints. Hey, so I the way I could uh, would write this up in a report is I would say that. I can be at least 95%, at least 95% confident that the mean response uh, associated with uh, the, the point 55100 is between these two points, 12.339 and 13.63378. And at the same time, that uh, the mean response associated with the point 10, 10, 100 or whatever it was uh, falls between 13.00967 and 14.19318. Okay. All right. Next item on the list, we want to do working hoteling intervals. Okay. So I'm going to just uh, go ahead and uh, say p equals four okay I know that we have four parameters and I'm going ahead going to go ahead and compute that w statistic um, there from the notes okay and uh, you can see it there it is it turns out to be 3.15 something or other um, I've got to compute the the yh hats and um, here's how I'll do that I'll, first I'm going to say let uh, uh, x be um, I'm going to c bind um, uh, a couple of ones with my points and you can see what that looks like it's um, it's some ones with these new points it's a it's a small data matrix right and then um, I'm gonna set uh, it turns out if if I look at uh, I don't know if you know about this but if I do uh, coef of out um, it'll give me my coefficients those are my my b values so what I'm gonna do here is um, I'm actually going to store those um, as a matrix because I want to do matrix multiplication. Um, coef of out, okay. And so if I take a look at the, that, um, I've got those are just my B values, and they are in fact as a matrix. Okay, yeah. All right. So, um, so then my YH hats, that's going to be that um, XX data, uh, where is it, I haven't done it yet, um, okay, I guess uh, we can do like this, uh, call it XX, and it's just going to be our X matrix, but as a matrix. Okay, and then um, so now if I take a look at XX and take a look at uh, coefs, okay, I can in fact multiply these, right, because uh, this is a 2 by 4, that's a 2 by 4, and this is a 4 by 2, or 4 by uh, 1, right, so, the, so, that, so that should definitely work. Um, I'll do XX times uh, coefs, right, that'll give me my y h hats okay and um, so then the estimated covariance matrix is um, I'll call it uh, s s q dot y h hat dot h okay is is this right it's it's that uh, um, I'm just following the formula from the notes there it's uh, it's that uh, our data matrix times the covariance uh, matrix of the B's and then times the transpose of our data matrix. And so then to get that working hoteling interval for the first point at 55100, five, um, I just do uh, 
uh, my best guess, right? Y hats 1, 1 minus that W number times the square root of all that stuff. Then same stuff, but plus that margin of error. Um, and then to get the working hoteling interval for the second point, it's this, the basically it's essentially the same stuff, right? It's the same deal there. Um, I just got to pick off the the right values from from my um, SSQ matrix and my y hats vector, y h hats vector. Okay. Finally, in number five, make simultaneous prediction intervals for new responses based on the same predictor levels from the previous parts. Okay, that these predictor levels. Okay, those two predictor levels. This will be super easy. Slam dunk. Okay, I'm going to do this the quick way. Um, I'm going to use that predict function because I'm tired and there's no, there's really no reason those formulas are working. Okay, they all work. Um, and uh, that's how you do it. Predict out. This is my output from the linear model. Um, remember, again, super important when you have your 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 new points in here. This uh, just a couple things. Number one, it has to be a data frame. Number two, the names across the top for the variables have to match exactly the names from your li from your linear model output. And interval type this time I've changed to prediction because we want to um, we want to know a, a, an interval where we can be 95 98 whatever percent confident that or or sure that 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 a that a new response will land in um, my Bonferroni adjusted level then is 0.975 because I'm making two of them my family uh, confidence level is 95 percent and there it is okay it tells me what the fits are which are Mid, the midpoints of these intervals. Okay, and I've got two of them. Okay, point one, this is my confidence interval. Point two, this is my confidence interval for it. I can be 95% confident that a new response, that, that if I were to make a, a new, uh, an observation of a new response um, at, uh, at the 5, 5, 100 location and the 10 10 100 location at the same time that those would fall in between these two um, within these two intervals at the same time.